to the Festival of Storytellers. can't tell you how excited I am to be on right now. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks of, of excitement, uh, getting prepared, and I've done a lot of things in my life, but this has got to be close to the top. Thank you, Reed is magnet, and I thank you, John, for uh, putting this forth and taking the chance on our authors in, in, uh, in presenting this out to, to the world. I've, I've enjoyed this immensely, Joanne. Ellie, so have I. Thank you for, for who you are, and thank you, Reader's Magnet. You all are beautiful, and you've worked so very hard, and we are blessed. We, we are. are. I thank everybody that's involved with this process because we know writers need readers and writers need publishers. We thank Readers Magnet and everybody that's involved. I love Readers Magnet. They say, we share your stories with the world. Hello, my name is Maury Daniel, and I am honored and, and privileged to be here this morning uh, to introduce you to something, quite frankly, that uh, only in the recent few years uh, did I ever imagine would come into fruition. Uh, in July of this year, my new book, The Gospel You've Never Heard, was published, and uh, I've been very excited about the prospects of introducing it to as many readers as possible. And Reader's Magnet is affording me the opportunity to do that to probably the largest audience so far. And uh, it gives me a great deal of excitement about being here. I've identified as a Christian for over 50 years now. I had an opportunity due to a coach who uh, cared a great deal about me while I was an athlete in college back in this 1971 season uh, to be invited to attend a Fellowship of Christian Athletes summer conference in June of that summer. And it turned out to be the greatest week uh, of my life because it was that week that I prayed a very personal prayer and gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it wasn't that I had not heard about God and heard about the Son of God prior to that, my mom was a lead vocalist in the church choir. And so all the while we were, my sister and I were being raised and she was raising us alone. My parents were divorced when I was two and my father took off, left my mom to raise the two of us. So every Sunday we were told to sit in the pew and behave or else and got a chance to listen to our mom's wonderful voice. And I just remember during those years thinking, well, this is where people came to meet with God. And by the time I was a college athlete, I really, I was baptized at the age of 12. And of course, basically told that as a result of that baptism, water immersion for me at the time, I was now a Christian. And the basic directive for me from that point on was to try to be a good person. I mean, that's kind of what I was led to believe a Christian was being a good person. And by the time I was a senior in high school, uh, I had been a good enough athlete to have an opportunity to go to college to play football at Northwestern University. And that's where I had a chance to, to meet this coach who arranged for me to go to this summer conference in Colorado. The thing that moved me that week were, were some of the people that I got to meet, professional athletes like Willie Lanier and Jerry Stowall and Jerry May, and even a, a college athlete by the name of Doug Kingswriter, all-American tight end from the University of Minnesota. 
And the thing that I sensed from them that I really never sensed before, they gave speeches to the, to the whole conference. And there were about probably 40 or 50 of us college athletes and maybe another 400, 450 high school athletes all divided into groups that each one of us college athletes were responsible for. What I sensed from these guys when I heard them speak, they all consistently talked about a relationship, a relationship that they considered to be the most important relationship they had in their lives. And I knew by the middle of that week that the relationship that they were talking about was one that I didn't have. And I knew it was one that I needed to have. And that's what motivated me midweek to pray the prayer that I prayed. And of course, that was the beginning of what now has been over 50 years of a personal relationship that I've had with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one might ask, what motivated me to write a book after such a long journey? Why hadn't I written it before? Well, I retired in June of 2015 and had more time on my hands than I knew what to do with. And I've been part of a men's group that met every Friday morning, still meets every Friday morning for about 30 years. And I've been sharing and growing and teaching and testing and, and, and walking our walk together as men of God. And we've been growing. And they encouraged me once I retired and had the time to, to sit down and write about what it was that I had learned over my journey. And that's what my book is about. Subtitle is an understanding that will change your life. I was two decades into my faith life journey, which again began in the summer of 1971. And I did all the typical things after becoming a Christian. My wife and I, fortunately, she shares my faith. And, and uh, we settled in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area and looked for a church to get involved in and became in, involved in one of the larger evangelical churches in the community. And and in those early years, just began to do what you're supposed to do as new Christians, try to get in Bible studies and grow and sit at the feet of some good expositor of, Christ, of, of the scriptures and, and grow. Well, after five or six years, I was elected to the deacon board of that particular church, which at the time was a governing body and, and uh, had an opportunity to be in a, in, in a boardroom per se for the first time. And, uh, and quite frankly, began to have some very difficult struggles. So much so that, that I began to question my faith. I began to, and, and I wasn't questioning the existence of the Lord in my life, but I was questioning the reality of my experience as a Christian. There were verses in scripture that I would read, uh, all things happen for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And there were things happening in my life and, I, and I'm saying, how could this be for good? Or things like count it all joy when you suffer various trials. Well, we all have trials. And there were trials in my life at that time that there was no way I, I, I was counting them as joy. And I began to become very frustrated. And I knew the problem wasn't the Lord's. The problem was mine. There was something I didn't understand. And I was a business owner, entrepreneur at that time. I had a athletic foot or retail business that I'd had for about 14 years. And I got to the point where my faith life experience was so shallow that I began to wonder whether I could continue to play the game, uh, to, play the, to play the game, quite frankly, that I think many people play be, and don't know how to stop playing because uh, every Sunday they hear something from scripture or from somebody else that, they just in their mind say, well, that's not working for me. That's not working for me. And I sat down with, with my bride and I said, honey, I, you know what this means to me, this is what it means to us. I got to figure out what it is I don't understand. I, I'm going to sell the business and, and, and take whatever time it ne I need to, to, to kind of figure out what it is that I don't know. And so I did. Uh, I sold the business after 14 years. I got a little office about a mile from where we lived. We were raising our children. By that point, we, we have, were blessed with five. And uh, I just took that office, got my concordances, got my Bible, got some commentaries. Fortunately, came across a book on prayer that 
really put me in the right frame of mind. And uh, I just started to read and study and pray and read and study and pray. And eventually, after about almost two years into that journey, I started to hear things that I'd never heard before. Things about the gospel that I'd, I really never thought about, that I really never understood. And one of the most important things that I heard in those moments was the idea that as Christians, we really are supposed to regard only one person as our teacher. Doesn't we mean we dismiss the voices of other people? But at the end of the day, there's a section in the Acts that talks about a group called the Bereans who used to hear whatever they heard about God's truth and take it back to the scripture to verify it was accurate. Of course, the only scripture they had in that time was the Old Testament. We are much more blessed because we've got the other testament that we can take things back to to be confirmed. And when I read the verse about where Jesus says that we're only to regard one as teacher, I knew that uh, that had not been my mindset up to that point. Most, if not all, of what I believed um, was based on what other people told me. And yes, I spent some time in the Bible, but never, never the way that I began to spend time once I started to go to that office every day. And it was interesting to me, you know, being an athlete most of my life, playbooks were incredibly important to us. I remember I spent a very brief amount of time in, with the Dallas Cowboys in training camp. And uh, they had a policy that, it, that if you weren't on the practice field in your uniform working out, you better have your playbook in your hand. And of course, I was a quarterback. And so the playbook was incredibly important. I, I was responsible for not only knowing what I was supposed to do on any given play, but virtually what all the other 10 guys on the offense were supposed to do at the same time. And I would spend hours and hours and hours studying that playbook. Well, as I'm at this crossroads in my life, trying to figure out what it is I don't understand and hearing the Lord tell me, not only am I to be your only teacher, <laughs> you haven't been coming to the only place you can actually hear my voice. And that is my word. And uh, in short order, I came across things from Paul, for example, that, that talk about what actually happens when we accept the Lord in our life is we actually receive his mind. When the Holy Spirit comes into our life, we are gaining access to the mind of Christ. And, when I continue to read and he said, what you have in this book, this book that has long been my most important possession, this is my Bible, it's old, but it means everything to me. I'm holding it together with duct tape, uh, are the spiritual words that reflect the spiritual thoughts of the mind of Christ. And all of a sudden, verses that I'd heard many times before all of a sudden, I began to hear what they were saying. Thy word from Psalm 119, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word which comes forth from the mind of God. I realized that if I was going to be transformed once now that I've become a Christian, I've, really, I've, I've had this spiritual freedom that I needed to do what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Now that I've got this freedom spiritually to worship who I want to worship, I need to present myself to the only one that can transform me by the renewing of my mind. And I began to spend more time in his word than I've ever spent in my life. And over a period of time, I began to hear his voice. And my time in his word, listening to his voice, quieting my heart, coming to him as a child, putting my human personal intellect aside and just saying, Lord, teach me. You know the hunger of my heart. You know the desire of my heart is to be able to walk in the way that you walked. And up to this point, I, you, I've been on a roller coaster. And, 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 you know, we've got a major problem with Christianity in America today, and, and you don't need me to confirm it. Just Google crisis in Christianity, the decline of Christianity in America. Pastors, so-and-so sex scandal. I mean, 
the hypocrisy in the church is visible, particularly to people outside the church. And of course, uh, and the hypocrisy for me, there was no bigger place for me to observe it than when I was looking in a mirror. And I, I just was convinced that that's not how, that's not the abundant life that the Lord, the Lord came to give us. And so I started this journey. And along and along, I reached a point of realizing that what I lacked was an accurate understanding of the gospel. There's a proverb that says, understanding is a fountain of life to him who has it. Another one that talks about the acquisition of wisdom, Proverbs 4, 7. But keep in mind, while you're acquiring this wisdom, make sure you get understanding. I mean, even Albert Einstein said, any fool can understand. The, the key is, excuse me, any fool can know the key is to understand. Any fool can know the key is to understand. And so I began searching. And the thing that was driving me, I knew in the depth of my heart, the, the one thing that has never left me from that moment in the mountains of Colorado is his presence in my life. Of course, as Christians, we are under serious attack. I mean, <laughs> over the course of my 50 years, this thing has been totally discredited in the in the minds of the non-believing world. You know, it's an, Christopher Hitchens, uh, the late atheist who did a lot of writing, you know, God is not great, etc. Or Sam Harris, you know, another atheist who writes, basically say this is nothing but an outdated history book of opinions of human beings that have long since been put aside. They can argue about the, the lack of validity of the book that I believe is the word of God all they want. The one thing they can't take from me and never have been able to take from me and never will be able to take from me is the presence that I feel in my life because he's there. And it's that presence that drove me to the seeking and the searching that led to the writing of this book. Uh, my motivation was because I wanted to know the truth. And when the scripture tells me that if I claim to know the Lord and I'm not endeavoring to walk, this is from 1 John, and I'm not endeavoring to walk in the manner that he walks, I'm not speaking the truth. In fact, the hard word in scripture is I'm a liar. And as an athlete, I mean, over the course of my life, I've heard lots of athletes talk about the level of their athletic ability. The thing that is crystal clear is we can, we athletes can talk all we want about how great we are. But at the end of the day, the proof's in the pudding. When you get on the field of, of, of competition and play the game, people are going to know you're good or you're not good, etc. Well, we Christians seem to have this immense dissociate, disassociation between what we claim to be over and against how most people see us live. And when people that are falling short, I don't think it's happening intentionally. I think it's because of lack of understanding. And I'm basically beginning this journey at that time with the Lord saying, Lord, help me understand what I don't know. I want to walk every day in the manner that you walk. And I know that's what you want me to do. I mean, I know the hard verses in Scripture, Jesus says we're to be perfect. How perfect are we supposed to be? He says, as perfect as your heavenly father. Peter rephrases it. First Peter, he talks about we're supposed to be holy. How holy? As holy as God is holy. Well, every human being on the planet, especially us Christians, would say, if I'm having a conversation with the Lord, and believe me, I've had this conversation many times, but Lord, I can't do that. I mean, my life experience convinces me I can't do that. <laughs> and he, he'd kind of, you know, look at me and say, well, Maury, that's exactly right. You can't do that but I can. That's why I came into the world to release the captives and to fill you with the only power that's greater than the power of sin. But my being in your life doesn't guarantee your being in mine. And the only way you're going to experience my power Enabling you to walk in the manner that I walk 
is if you surrender your life to me and you remind yourself every day, that's what you need to do. That's why Paul says, I die daily. I carry about within me the dying of Christ that his life will be manifest in mine. And as I'm growing in this understanding and he's teaching me and I'm spending time in his word and he's beginning to hide his word in my heart, I'm beginning to realize what it means to die to self. Jesus comes, came into my life. I didn't hear it at the time. It took me a long time to hear it because I thought I had what he came to give me, a guaranteed place in heaven. And it was only when I began to realize that's not why he came into my life. There is an opportunity in heaven at some point. But the principal reason he came into my life in the here and now is to set me free spiritually and fill me with the only power, as I said a moment ago, this greater than the power of sin, so that I could actually realize the desire of my heart. And that is to walk in the way that he walked, to be able to do his will. And in short order is to be holy. And when people say, but we can't do that, I say, you're right. You can't do that. But Jesus can do that. But it doesn't happen by osmosis. And he's not going to enable you automatically. I like to think of it as a car. I got this <laughs> toy, brand, one of my grandchildren's toys. And I use it for an example. We come into the world Adam, when Adam was created, he was the only passenger in this car. This is the dust that was molded into his body and God from the press of his nostrils. Whoop, sorry. There's the music going on. <laughs> you get the idea with the car. Then there's a law. Don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. We all know what happened there. Well, the net result of that was... The music has stopped. The net result of that was there's now two passengers in this car, this body of Adam's. His spirit originally breathed into it by God. And now we have a second passenger, a contrary passenger, a spiritual presence of evil. And we know that Adam and Eve realized it because the first thing they saw as a result of this contrary presence, was their nakedness. They've been naked the whole time. Never bothered them before. But now they see themselves entirely differently because there's a contrary influence in their car. And secondly, we know the contrary influence because they hear the sound of God, sound they've heard many times before, and they go cover themselves and hide. Why? Because they're afraid. Well, isn't it interesting? Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And, of course, the net result of this is there's a law that's been written in their heart. They don't realize it yet, but it's a law of the knowledge of good and evil. They now, what God has now established in them is a conscience, a line that they can not really define yet because there is no law beyond the law of the knowledge of good and evil, which is in their heart, that they can understand. But it gives them the ability to start sensing it. Well, this is the condition of every human being that's born and has been born since Adam. This is what's called the unregenerate condition. There's two spiritual entities in every human being. Their original God-breathed spirit and the presence of evil. Well, mankind goes through 4,000 years of frustration and struggle. God interacts directly with the people and gives them his personal presence. And yet they continue to fall and come back and fall and come back. Why? Because they were in an unregenerate spiritual condition. And as Paul so eloquently shows us, you finally get to a point, if you really have a heart for God, crying out, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Well, 2,000 years ago, God responded to that cry. I think this is the one that opens. Yeah. Knock at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Any man who opens that door, I will come in. So you pray a prayer. You become what Christianity calls born again. Now you got three passengers in your car. And the glorious thing that that new passenger does the minute he gets in is he breaks the bonds of which that contrary passenger has been controlling your life and he throws them in the back seat. I wish he would have thrown them out of the car, but he doesn't. Still in there. But so is he. 
And the scripture tells us he'll never leave or forsake us. Now, this is what's happening and has happened because of, I believe, an, an inaccurate gospel representation. There's a mantra out there today that says, if you want a better life, a meaningful life, and an eternal life in heaven, believing and receiving is all that's required. Well, that basically has led people to think that the only thing they need to do is they need to open that door, get Christ in, close it, and they're good to go. And you know what happens for most people? <laughs> they keep driving their car. The Lord sits in the passenger seat. They think his presence gives them a guaranteed place in heaven, which is what they think he came to give them in the first place. And the guy in the back seat loves that because he continues to control and influence and tempt your driving. Jesus did not do what he did to be a passenger in anybody's car. He did what he did to become one with your spirit and your spirit one with his. And then thereby in the oneness that you have, Paul's favorite phrase was being in Christ. You can, his power actually enables you to drive your car the way the desire of your heart wants it to go. And what Jesus is saying to us is the same thing he said to the woman in sin, go and sin no more. One day at a time. What's Jesus saying in Matthew 5? Seek first his kingdom, which is spiritual, which once you get him in your car, you're now in that kingdom. It's present within you. And his righteousness. But where is his righteousness? It's in him. It's in him. And what we need to learn to do once he, and I need it for 22 decades. I didn't understand this. He was in my car, no question. But I had no idea. I, I was clueless regarding the concept of what it meant to die to self. If anybody wishes to find his life, he must lose it. Anybody who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is sitting there saying, Maury, you want to walk in the way that I walk? Then you need to do for me what I did for you. You need to die to yourself. You need to understand, no matter how great the desire of your heart is, if you try to fulfill the law in your own strength, you're not going to be able to do it. Paul tells us in Romans 8 that the reason God sent his son into the world was that in order that the requirement of the law, which is obedience, might be fulfilled in us. It's not guarantee it's going to be fulfilled. It might be. The key to whether it is or not is, do I die to myself and let him do it for me? Do I hold myself accountable to be walking in the manner that he walked? And that's the key. That's the key. When I began to realize that, yes, the Lord was in my life, but my understanding of what it meant to be one with him was wanting terribly. I mean, all of a sudden that John 17 prayer, just before Jesus is going to be taken, and he's last really the last time close up and personal with his disciples, he prays that they would understand the oneness that he has had with the Father and the Father with him during the time he's been with them, so that they would understand the opportunity for the oneness that was now going to become theirs. And there was, you know, She's just at one point said, look, guys, if you don't understand what I'm saying, watch what I do. Because the works that you see me doing are a validation that not only is the Father in me, but I am in the Father. That's the same for us. When Paul says that there are works that were created beforehand, that we should walk in them. And Jesus says we're supposed to be working the works of the Father. Those are the works that he enables us to do and that he actually does through us if we understand how to surrender ourselves to him every day. There's a, one of my favorite verses is in Galatians. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. So what do I need to do every day? The same thing that Paul did. I need to die daily. I need to hold myself accountable to what I know to be true. Now, here's the problem with many, and all the data shows this, and, and, and all this information uh, is in my book. But by and large, people are virtually biblical illiterate these days. 
most people who go to church, and this is a broad brush and it doesn't cover everybody. There's a lot of great Bible studies going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But most people, the only time they hear scripture is when they sit in the pew and the pastor opens and this, this is the verse we're going to do for today. There's no quality time being spent in a word from the mindset of I need this. This is as important to me as breathing. This is important to me as any food I put into my mouth. If I hope <laughs> there's a verse that Paul talks about, we're purposing to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. How can I take my thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ if I don't know Christ's thoughts? And the only way I can know his thoughts is by spending time in his word. I began to be exposed to understandings of, of gospel mantra, terms that are very common in the gospel, words like salvation and faith and works and eternal life. And I began to realize that my understanding at the time was not accurate. I have a quiz that I give to people on occasion. For example, ask them, how many salvations does the gospel reference? One or two? And virtually everyone answers one. Confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. This is from Paul. And you will be saved. Well, people have been led to believe that that salvation is unto an eternal life in heaven. That salvation is a reference to the death that Paul had and that we all human beings are born into, the spiritual death of captivity to sin. When he says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? It's the spiritual death that he inherited as a result of the original condemnation of God, which was the consequence of Adam's transgression. You confess Jesus as Lord. His, his name is the only name in heaven by which any human being can be saved from that death. There are only two spiritual conditions that all human beings can be in. Either unregenerate or regenerate. And the regenerate is basically born again Christians. People who confess with their mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart. God raised him from the dead. That door opens. He comes. The spirit comes into their life. Paul writes about circumcising them, cutting them free from the bondage of sin that's held them captive so that now they're free in spirit, able to choose who they're going to follow. Every day they have an opportunity to choose who they're going to follow. They're either going to surrender the relationship of oneness and be in the Lord so that he's the one that's going to be driving their car. Their hands are always the ones that are on the wheel, but it's his power that enables them to walk in the manner that he walked or they're gonna to continue to be listening and tempted by the guy in the back seat, who absolutely is not happy about the fact that Jesus is now in that person's life. He wants them to continue to not understand all that has now become available to them. That's why Paul says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. That's the key, that's the key. I mean, this isn't rocket science. And the great joy, the greatest joy of my discovery is how much Jesus loves me and why, and why he's in my life. And he wants me to have the desire of my heart, which is to be able to love my wife in an unbelievable way, to love my kids, to have relationships with human beings where I can actually consider them as more important than myself. Those are things I, I didn't do very consistently. I've always loved my wife. But I didn't even know the definition of love <laughs> until the Lord started to express it to me. And that's when I began to grow. And these last three decades of my faith life journey, I, I mean, my subtitle again, an understanding that will change your life. It changed everything for me. That mantra if you want a better life, a more meaningful life, and an eternal life in heaven, believing in receiving, comes from John 1, 12. For as many as, listen to this, for as many as received him, to them gave he the power or the right. I like power. It's dunamis in the Greek. I like power better. The right to become children of God, even to those that believe in his name. Now, the most important, power is a very important word, but even a more important word in that verse to the understanding of the verse is Become, for as many as received him, to them gave he the right or the power to become children of God, 
even to those who believe in his name. That doesn't say you are a child of God because you have him in your life. You receive him. No question. He comes into your car. But his presence there is not what makes you a child of God. Paul doesn't say that the righteous is the person who has faith. He says the righteous person in God's eyes is the person who lives by faith. He lives in accordance to what he knows to be true. And let's do away with this idea of the of the disjunct dysfunction of faith and reason. I mean, faith, Webster's, the ascent of the mind to the truth that's declared by another. Reason, my ability to think, observe, take in knowledge, reason it out, and make a decision on the basis of what it is that I've absorbed from a knowledge perspective. Well, why is the knowledge that this book presents me unreasonable stuff that I should believe? Most people are not wanting to believe this or understand because they're afraid, quite frankly, of what it will require of them. And the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ does require something. It requires a dying to self. There's a verse in scripture in Hebrews that says, it's been appointed for all men once to die. And there's not a person on the planet who's going to deny the truth. I mean, for many people, that's just one little section of scripture that they have to say, well, that's true. Because the human experience validates we're all going to die at some point. But there's another part of that verse that's very, absolutely is true, in my opinion, is the first part. And then the judgment. Jesus and Paul tell us there's going to come a time when we're going to have to give an account for the way in which we chose to live our lives. And we have a plethora of options in the way in which we're going to live our lives. But it's like me. I go back to my football. When I was in Dallas, I had Dallas playbook. Trust me, I wasn't walking around the Dallas camp with the Oakland Raider playbook in my hands. I had the Dallas Cowboy playbook in my hands because that's the way the Cowboys wanted me to play the game. This is the way that the guy we're going to be standing in front of at some point in time in the future, and it's a date that we all will meet. There will be no avoiding it. We're all going to meet it. And it always occurred to me, I no doubt in my mind the Lord's going to be just with me. But if he's going to be just with me, he's going to be making his decision on the basis of something that I could have and therefore should have known while I was alive. He's not going to hold me accountable to something I couldn't know and understand. I'm living in a time when this book's available to me. I've spent enough time in it. I have zero doubt about it not being the word of God. I believe that there's a thread of truth, an unbroken thread of truth that runs from the first word in Genesis all the way to the last word in Revelation. Now, historical critical thought, there may be some bumps in the road along the way, but at the end of the day, those are not bumps that keep me from knowing what I need to know to make a decision every day, how I'm going to live my life. And I'm going to leave you with this final thought hopefully to encourage you to get my book because there's a lot of things in my book that I explain that I learned along this journey. But I've developed a habit, which I find very helpful. And you, you know, I don't know how this is going to sound to you, but it's very real for me. I go through the pretty much the same routine when I'm at home, I get up in the morning, I'll shower, I'll shave, whatever. And, and James talks a verse about looking in the man in the mirror, etc. At some point in time, in those moments of getting ready for the day, I'm looking into my eyes in the mirror. And I, and I actually pause and keep looking until I actually see his eyes. And, and there are many things we've talked about in those moments. But the, 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 the one consistent question he asks me every day. Okay. Is it going to be your will today? or my will today. And if I claim to be a child of God, Paul tells me, true sons of God aren't people who have the Spirit. They're people who are led by the Spirit. Doesn't mean I'm immune to sin. Doesn't mean I'm not going to stumble. 
Although <laughs> Jude, there's a very frustrating verse, true verse in Jude that says he's even able to keep us from stumbling. My book is about an understanding that changed my life and it can change your life. I, I really hope you'll consider giving it a chance. And if you like it, share it. I'm always available. You know, you got questions, you can shoot me an email on my website, maury at maurydanu.com. I, I, I would love to engage with you um, because I, I believe that this message that God sent into the world 2,000 years ago is the most important communication he ever sent to mankind. And yeah, I mean, in fairness, if, if we Christians, if the church today is honest with itself, um, we're falling short of the mark. And, and I say in fairness, I don't believe that's intentional. I, I believe it's due to a lack of understanding. It wasn't intentional on my part. It was because the things that I understood regarding the gospel were not accurate. I believe now I have a way better accurate understanding of what I need to be doing every day. And that allegory of the car and passengers in the car is, again, it's, it's not a difficult thing to understand. If you've prayed a prayer at some point in your life, and, and, and what happened in that moment is irrelevant in the sense that maybe fireworks went off, maybe they didn't. Maybe you didn't, maybe, you know, you, you prayed a prayer when you were a kid and you can't even remember it, but you think it was real and you've believed yourself to be a Christian. You pray that prayer, the Lord knows the intention of your heart. And if your heart's turned toward him, he is there in that moment. The spirit comes into your life. But then it becomes learning how to let him be your life. one point the Lord said to me, Maury, I came to be your life because it's my life that's the only life that can accomplish the objective of our Father. All of a sudden, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I began to realize it's his life that I need to be reflecting. It's his life that people need to be seeing through me. We are vessels for the greatest truth in the existence of the world, the truth that's revealed in the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Learning how to be consistent in that message changes everything. So that's it for today. I will look forward to speaking with you again uh, at the next live stream. I'm sorry I've been going on. Uh, there may have been some questions I might have been able to answer, but uh, there was a question about faith and, and reason. And I think I, I hope, I, hope I, you know, I, I often talk about when people are struggling about my belief uh, in the Lord and the death and resurrection, et cetera. You know, I, I typically ask people, have you ever heard of Abraham Lincoln? Of course, People do. So tell me, what do you know about him? Well, he was our 16th president and president during the Civil War. And he was assassinated by an actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth. And I say to them, well, how do you know that? How, how, well, it's, it's history. It's, it's, it's in the history books. And you, and you believe it. Oh, you, sure I do. Well, I've got a similar story. It's a little older than that one. But you know, the Lincoln story depending upon how long the Lord waits to come back, we could be out another thousand years or 2000 years. The Lincoln story that you believe, which you didn't see, but you believe might be a thousand or 2000 years old, 2000 years from now. People, do you expect people to not believe it then? I mean, you believe it now, 2000 years from now, should people believe that? Well, the same is true with the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just the Bible that affirms that a man named Jesus existed. I've read the story. Now that I've spent time in it with my whole being, I understand the story. And it's every bit as true. His resurrection, 
his appearance to over 500 people after he rose from the dead is every bit as true as the fact that Abraham Lincoln was shot in the back of the head by John Wilkes Booth. I think the reason, unfortunately, for many people, the hesitancy they have about believing the historical accuracy of this son of God and what happened to him when he came into the world 2000 years ago is because what will be required of them if they actually embrace it. Dying to self is, it's a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to understand. But the reality of it is when you surrender your life to Christ, it's, it's, your life is not all of a sudden going to become a blah, vanilla journey. Your life is going to be un, no, it's not going to be free of trials, but you're actually going to be able to count it all joy when you suffer various trials, which is what scripture says. Because a trial is nothing more, or less, and they're going to be in this world because the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. A trial is nothing more than an opportunity for you to prove your faith. How you walk through that trial validates who's walking for you in that trial. So there's so many things for you to understand. I'm, I'm, I truly encourage you to consider reading my book. And uh, again, I'm always available for questions. And uh, it's my sincerest desire that, that uh, it will do for you what it did for me. I loved writing it. it took me about four years. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I, it's something I, I taught my men's group guys for, as I said, we're almost 30 years together now. And, and uh, I think they would all tell you that it's made a huge difference in their lives as well. So in any event, I'm not sure how I close out of this, but um I just appreciate the time. Uh, I think I've got two or three more of these coming up. Uh, I've got one on the 11th and one on the 15th and one on the 18th. And, and then I think I'm scheduled for, a, for an hour uh, on the 20th. So you can find all that on the, on the Storyteller's website. And uh, again, I just uh, I thank you immensely uh, for this chance to be with you. And uh, I'll look forward to the next time. And between now and then, if you've got questions that you might like me to address in the next live stream, uh, just shoot them to my email. And uh, again, that's Maury at MauryDaney.com. And, and uh, I will do what I can to share with you. So again, uh, God bless you. Uh, thank you for the time. And uh, whatever books you're going to get, reading is, is a great gift. And uh, um, I so appreciate this chance to be here. Thank you, Reader's Magnet. Thank you, people who've listened. Appreciate it. God bless.